can remember when we didn't have these great big um, four-lane highways, you know, Interstate 68 that runs through Cumberland and Corridor H that runs through Moorfield, you know, those great big highways. So this is Corridor H. You see how it, the roadway kind of jumps from mountaintop to mountaintop. And Isaiah said that we're to prepare the way. We're to make straight a highway. And every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain shall be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Now doesn't that, isn't that what these highways do for us? You know, when before we had to go up and down the hills and around the curves, and it, it just took a lot longer to do that. But now we have these straight, smooth highways, you know, jumping from mountaintop to mountaintop. And that's what Isaiah told us to do, right? Well, I think Isaiah was talking about something different. Isaiah was talking about our lives not our roadways. And we're, we're supposed to make our lives straight and smooth. We're supposed to make the relationships that we have with other people straight and smooth and, um, um, and level. Okay? I think I lost them. <laughs> So when you, when you consider your family and your friends, and you want to have a, a smooth relationship with them. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we lift up these young people and we ask your blessing on them as they grow and mature in faith. May your spirit guide them to keep their lives smooth. level out the rough places in their relationships. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Lift your voices with a shout. 
Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. The word of God for the people of God.
title of Mark's Gospel tells us that this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But notice where the story begins. For Mark, it doesn't begin in Bethlehem. It doesn't begin in a manger with angels and shepherds and wise men. It begins in the wilderness. It begins with a promise from God. The prophet Isaiah spoke, a voice cries out, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The promise is for comfort and peace for the exiled people of Judah, a people in the wilderness, separated from nation, temple, and traditions. The gospel repeats these words as comfort for another people also in the wilderness, caught in an oppressive religious system in a country under foreign occupation. And these words also speak to us, to all people who have lived and will live in the millennia between the first and second advents of Jesus Christ. Now, theologically, the wilderness is not a place. It's a condition. It's a frame of mind. The wilderness is different from everyone. Maybe it's the feeling of despair or hopelessness. It could be anger or pain. Maybe it's a feeling, maybe it's no feeling at all. Maybe it's, a, it's just a kind of numbness. More often, I think, it's a blindness. It's being in the dark. Rather than being salt and light, our lives have become bland and our lights have dimmed. Author and theologian Mark Allen Powell compares it to a game of hide and seek. Now, you've all played hide and seek, I'm sure, at some point in your lives. Everyone runs and hides and the one who's it has to go and find them. Now what's interesting about that is that the fun only starts when the person is found. You know, it's not so much fun to be by yourself, hiding under the bed you know, with the dust bunnies and whatever the cat man left behind. The wilderness is where we are while we're waiting for God to find us and change us. How long, O oh Lord, will you tarry? How long must we endure? The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The prophets shout, Here is your God. So we, like the exiled Jews, rejoice that God, who seemed to be defeated, who seemed to be disturbingly absent from our world, our God is returning with power and great glory. For us, the Advent season moves from despair to hope and now to peace. This Advent season finds the world with many of the same problems that have plagued humanity throughout history. The haves have more and more, and the have-nots have less and less. This creates a great mass of people without hope, despairing of ever escaping the crush of poverty, hunger, and disease. Young people are easily manipulated into acts of crime and violence to find relief and to assert themselves in a world which gives them too little other opportunities. And every day we read or hear in the news of the symptoms of this condition and we despair because there is little we can do. The weight of economic systems, politics, cycles of destructive weather, 
and all the other factors which hold people in poverty, including just plain old meanness and evil, far exceed our ability to make much of a difference. We have our own problems, too. This is nothing new. The economy and various corporations haven't been too friendly to many folks here. Jobs are lost. Many people face lifestyle and health issues, their own or loved ones. Some sink into the abyss of addictions. Many grieve as loved ones pass away, often much too soon. People you trust and respect let you down. Marriages fail. Children are hurt as families fall apart. This is the wilderness. But it is the wilderness through which we are called to prepare the way for our Lord Jesus Christ. It is into this wilderness that we must speak a word of hope. In peace. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we find an exhortation that when Christ comes again, we should strive to be found by Him at peace. But we live in a fearsome world. And I know this is hard. But as we learned during, this, during Easter time, Christ said, Peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Every Sunday here in this worship service we approach Christ and each other with peace. We pass the peace. You know, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And you respond, and also with you. In the prayers of the people, we pray for peace for all of God's people. Christ gives us peace so we can share the peace of Christ with the other people, with the other person we find who is fearful, who is being consumed by trouble, who is lashing out in anger at all they cannot control. When we pray for peace for us as God's people, we are not praying that somehow we will be exempt from all the conflict and trouble, that we will be protected from the dangers and tragedies in the world. These are all part of life, no matter who you are. Our hope is in Christ's fulfillment of the kingdom of God, when there will be no conflict or trouble for anyone. But the peace we pray for, the peace Christ gives us, the peace we share with others is in the here and now. It is not an absence of trouble, but peace in the midst of trouble. It is wholeness and fulfillment as human beings. It is harmony with others and with all of creation. It is contentment, even in the presence of trouble, as we are in God's presence and experiencing God's pleasure and perfect love. And I taught a Bible study some time ago. It was a good Advent lesson. It was about bringing up there down here. About making the way things are on earth like the way things are in heaven. And this is about the line in the Lord's Prayer. Um, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I got to thinking, you know, we're living here, here between the Advents, and Jesus has come and shown us the way the kingdom has come on earth, and Jesus will come again to, to bring all of creation into the perfection and fulfill in, uh, <coughs> kingdom of God. So all of us, everything, is about what we do here, right now. This is how we prepare the way of the Lord. 
Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 22 that all the commandments in the Bible, all the things that we're exhorted to do or refrain from doing can be summed up by love God and love our neighbor. And the world will know that we are His disciples, Christ's disciples, if we love each other. So preparing the way of the Lord is all about love. It's about our relationships. Romans chapter 15, Paul says, Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. Now can you imagine what the world would be like, how incredibly different life would be right now if everyone lived only to please other people? Well, certainly. If we only try to please other people, some people will take advantage. They'll take advantage of us and use us mercilessly. Well, perhaps. But Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3 that we are God's chosen people, chosen ones. Right there, we have peace in knowing that God will provide for us and we can stop worrying about ourselves. We can be clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We can forgive. We can let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. You see, it's not about us. We have to get ourselves out of the center of our lives and allow God and other people to be there. That all of these relationships that we have down here will not be about us, but about God, and about other people. So when you go home today, think about all the people with whom you have a relationship. You know, your spouse, your family, friends, your employer, your next door neighbor, the, the server at your favorite restaurant, the folks right here in church. And then for the rest of the Advent and Christmas seasons, look for ways and opportunities to please them. Prepare the way of the Lord for each one whom God puts in your path. And let the light of Christ shine on them down here through you. So may all God's peaceful people say, Amen. And may all God's